In January 2023, the escape clause that triggered the suspension of the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact will expire. Well, if nothing's done to replace the pact in the meantime, that's going to mean some pretty painful fiscal adjustments for countries that have been struggling to cope with COVID-19. Well, a new proposal offers a two-part solution to this problem, but is it economically and politically feasible? Hello, Veronica. Welcome. Hello. Uh, Veronica, how urgent is it to find a replacement for the Stability and Growth Pact? Is, uh, what happens if we just say we just decide to kick this decision down the road again? I think the main reason uh, why it is urgent to replace the Stability and Growth Pact uh, is that Europe is setting some ambitious uh, objective uh, for itself, both in terms of green transition, digitalization, and now also defense. And uh, these uh, objectives require big public investment uh, from the member states. And unfortunately, the, the existing rules are not leaving much room for those. You want to revise the fiscal rules here, first of all. Is it because the fiscal rules that we've got are too complicated, or is it because those rules, well, they just don't do what they're supposed to be doing? I think it's a little bit of both. The rules are definitely too complicated because they uh, come out from a series of regulatory intervention that they accumulated rather than being done in a systematic way. They're also not very realistic uh, in terms of objective, given the big changes in economic environment, both in terms of low interest rates and new approach towards fiscal policy. Uh, but they're also not achieving the right objective. And in particular, in particular they have been not... Uh, uh, counter-cyclical enough. And so they have required a painful uh, adjustment uh, uh, during uh, uh, recessions and they've not been uh, enough aggressive in requiring uh, uh, um, a, a fiscal uh, consolidation during good times. So what's your alternative? What's uh, What idea do you have to replace them? The proposal that I've worked uh, on with uh, um, Leonardo D'Amico, Francesco Giavazzi, Guido Lorenzoni and uh, Char Henry Way Mueller um, has uh, um, two components. Uh, on the fiscal real side, uh, and we'll talk about the rest later, um, there are two elements. One is that we are going to propose a spending real instrument and on the other side, we are going to propose an objective in terms of medium term debt reduction. And the crucial element is to make the speed of debt reduction slow overall, but also sensitive to the quality of the public spending that it's supposed to finance. So we propose to adjust more slowly the debt that has been accumulated to fight recessions, in particular when uh, the escape clause is active, and uh, the debt accumulated uh, uh, for uh, public investment or spending uh, that have uh, benefits in the medium of lo or long term. Is it going to be hard to distinguish between these debts that are fast adjusting and, and slow adjusting? Who's going to do that? So, of course, uh, it's not easy, especially um, for the public investment part. But I think that Next Generation EU has uh, offered a great blueprint uh, to teach us how to, do, how to do it. And so the idea is that the European institution can choose some long-term desirable objectives, for example, the green transition and defense, and can be also quite specific in uh, defining which type of projects they would fit in these uh, categories. And then the member states can make a proposal that is going to be evaluated by the commission. And, and this worked pretty well for next generation EU. So hopefully it will work for that too. And are you retaining the structure where every country inside the union is treated the same way? We are. De facto, they're not because the rules uh, depend on the type of spending. So different, different countries could decide uh, different categories of spending. And so the rules will turn out to be different. But the rules are the same for everybody. And the idea is that the main objective of the rules is to prevent financial instability. Uh, for high debt countries, especially, that's the important part. So designing rules that are designed to obtain reasonable degree of adjustment for those countries that have high level of debt is the key thing, and it's going to be enough uh, for the rules to be successful. I don't think that we can hope to design rules that could also induce countries with low level of debt to change their decisions of fiscal policy. And for that... Uh, 
I don't think the rules are the right tool for that type of coordination. Maybe you would need something more central fiscal capacity and more fiscal union uh, to uh, be effective. Now, for part two of your proposal, as you said, it's got two parts to it. You have uh, come up with the idea of a European debt management agency. Gosh, what kind of debt and how much debt would be managed at the European level? Yeah, so the idea of the proposal is to create a European agency that buys the debt from the member states that has been accumulated during the pandemic. So um, the way in which we are thinking about it is the debt accumulated in uh, between 2020 and 2022. And, uh, uh, and in exchange for that, this agency would issue uh, EU bonds. Uh, so the countries would remain responsible for servicing the portion of debt that is uh, acquired by the agency uh, by giving contributions to the agency that are proportional to the original acquisition. What are the benefits of doing this at the, at the European level rather than by country by country? So there are several benefits. I think, uh, first of all, uh, the fact that you pool all the debt and you issue EU, EU bonds uh, reduce the cost of servicing debt for the countries. And second, it increases the supply of European safe assets, which is good to make it easier, both monetary policy and also to strengthen the fiscal, uh, the banking union. Obviously, it's going to be a big change to, to set this up. How will that work in practice to, to, to get it going and to keep that working? Yeah, so the proposal is that this agency would uh, acquire gradually the debt uh, of each country that has been accumulated during COVID, and it would acquire it on the secondary market and would issue EU bonds. Um, each country will send contribution to the agency that are calibrated to cover the servicing of the portion of debt of that country that has been acquired. And the contribution would be calculated in a very conservative way so that the agency could make uh, some uh, accumulate some liquid reserves uh, that potentially could be used also for the EU budget, but would give a buffer to the agency in case of bad events. And of course, the question this raises, Veronica, is how quickly is that going to lead to a full fiscal union? It's a big step in that direction. For sure, it's a step in, in that direction. Um, and uh, um, but of course, to have a more complete fiscal union, it would require many more steps. For example, this contribution I've been talking about could be uh, actually dedicated tax revenues instead of contributions. And I think that uh, the path towards the fiscal union, to a proper, more proper fiscal union is there. And I hope that uh, we will uh, converge there soon. Well, it's a very interesting proposal, Veronica. There's loads of it, and we haven't had time to discuss oh, well, really any of it in detail today. So I recommend that everybody reads about it. Thank you for talking about it today. Thanks, Tim. As you can imagine, there's a lot in this proposal. So it's spread over two articles in Vox EU. They are called Revising the European Fiscal Framework, Part 1 and Part 2, published in January 2022. The authors are Leonardo D'Amico, Francesco Giavazzi, Veronica Guerrieri, Guido Lorenzoni and Charles-Henri Weimuller. Well, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.